And uh, now I will switch to English for our first speaker of the day. We are really happy to be able to welcome Paulina Grnarova today. Yes, you're, <laughs> you're welcome to already come to the stage with me. I will just quickly say a few words about yourself. So uh, Paulina is the co-founder and CEO of Deep Judge AI. Um, she has, uh, is originally from North Macedonia, but has studied computer science at EPFL, so in Switzerland, before doing her PhD at the ETH Zurich, before then launching her own startup, Deep Judge. Paulina um, wants to revolutionize the work of lawyers and other professional groups in the legal sector with Deep Judge, and she will be speaking to us today on how AI is revolutionizing the future of text. Thank you so much for uh, opening this conference and um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you so much and hello everyone. It is really great to be here. Um, it is quite amazing to see that the Swiss public sector is discussing topics such as artificial intelligence. Today I'm going to be focusing specifically on AI for text for two reasons mainly. The first one is that we have all seen and hopefully even tried the massive progress of AI when it comes to understanding and processing text. And the second reason is that there is quite a lot of text in the public sector. So between all the legal documents, the regulatory frameworks, and the entire communication, the Swiss public sector is really at a great position to strengthen its impact and optimize its processes. And this is the reason why we're here today, today to discuss the opportunities as well as the risks. But first things first, what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence basically means that if a machine can do a task that requires some type of human intelligence. And in terms of the definition or the words, artificial is clear, but intelligence it's not so clear. So it very much depends on how you define the words. And right now it is very heavily debated whether these models are in fact intelligent, like humans, or they are just merely mimicking the data. And in my view, this doesn't matter at all. Let's just ask the question of what can we do with these models and how can we benefit from them? And the story of AI started by humans really trying to program a computer with a bunch of rules. What you're seeing here is Eliza, which was one of the very first chatbots. And it's essentially the chat GPT of the 1960s. It is meant to mimic a Rogerian psychotherapist, so that means that if I as a human come and I type in a sentence, for example, I'm feeling very sad, then the chatbot would say, can you explain why you're feeling sad? And all of these answers were completely based on various different rules that the humans programmed. And people were really excited back in the days about this, as we were excited about ChatGPT, and they really thought that programming a machine with a bunch of rules is the way to solve intelligence. But of course, there are limits of programming rules um, and we quickly encounter them. So for example, if we switch to a different task and I show you this image, and just as a disclaimer, this image has been generated by an AI, but just by just giving it textual description of what it should present. But now coming back to the rules, and if I ask you as humans what is on top of the roof, you will very easily be able to say, oh, I see a little bird. But this task is insanely difficult for a machine. The machine doesn't really see images as we see with objects, but rather see pixels. And trying to program all the different rules here is really, really difficult because there are different types of birds, the, the roof can move, it can be of different shapes, and so on. So then the way to approach intelligence entirely changed and people thought, okay, instead of trying to program a bunch of rules such that the machine can rely on them, how about we let the machine figure out what the rules themselves are? And the way to do it is to give the machine a bunch of data points, in this case, a bunch of images that show pictures of houses with roofs and birds on top of them, for example, and we let the machine figure out how to detect what is the object sitting on the roof. 
And this kind of principle, giving data to the machine and machine figuring out rules, you have all seen before in the simplest form of linear regression. So in this case, we give the machine data points. These are the blue dots. We ask the machine to figure out the rule, and the rule is simply a line that describes the data. And this is now machine learning and the new way of intelligence. So the principle, giving data to the machine, the machine discovers rules. The humans never tell what the rules are to the machine. And this is a very simple example where the rule is a line, and the rules can be much more complicated, such as, for example, in the previous uh, case, recognizing what is the object on top, on top of the roof, or recognizing how to respond to a question that you give to a chatbot. The rules how to play that game are, are much more complicated. But in machine learning, we have a machinery to be able to figure out any type of rule, no matter how complicated this is. And this is basically a mechanism called neural network that actually stacks on top of each other a lot of these machines that figure out rules. And each layer takes the rule figured out by the previous layer and builds on top of that to form something very complex. So in this case, if we have, again, an example of recognizing something that is on an image, for example, a human face, and the rule that the machine needs to figure out is how do I detect whether this is a face or not. The first layer maybe comes up with a very simple rule. I'm going to just detect what are the edges on the image. The second layer says, OK, maybe if I see an edge like this and like this, it's an eye. And the next layer says, if I see an eye and if I see a nose, it is a human face. So all together, this machinery creates very complicated rules that can solve a lot of different tasks. And neural networks are the basic machinery behind deep learning. And in essence, the same principle is what you see behind ChatGPT or GPT-4. So we give the machine a lot of data, in this case text, and uh, the models figure out the rules behind language. And this is all a part of a field called natural language processing that is very heavily dominated these days by deep learning and by deep learning models. One of the basic ingredients behind uh, natural language processing are language models. And language models are basically the machines that are meant to figure out the rules behind natural language or the language of humans. And what I mean by figuring out the rules behind language is basically to figure out the mathematical definition behind language. Or in practice, this is if I have a sentence, let's say it starts with, I saw a cat, that then the machine is supposed to know which are words out of the vocabulary that are likely to come next to continue the sentence, and which are words that are unlikely. So for example, maybe I can continue it with, I saw a cat on or in, but it's very unlikely that I continue the sentence with, say, let's say, a banana or roller coaster. So figuring out how to continue sentences in a meaningful way, so kind of what is the probability distribution and what are the words that are likely to appear and the words that are unlikely to appear is the task of language models. And we are all probably interacting with language models much more often than we think, and it's not just through concepts like ChatGPT. Every time you go to the Google search engine and you type in a query, and then you get a suggestion of how to extend your query, that is a language model in the background. And it's basically predicting what is the continuation of the sentence based on what other people have typed in. So the language model has learned the probability distribution of how people search. And as you can imagine, there are quite a lot of sentences that can be formed and a lot of continuations for each sentence. So these models, in order to really learn the rules well, they require a lot of data. And when the models are trained on a lot of data, and when they are quite big, then they're called large language models, and that's what we see these days with the abbreviation LLMs. Um, and right now, we are training large language models with gigabytes and gigabytes of data. Um, they have reached training data sets of a trillion words, which, to put in perspective, is one million times the entire Lord of the Rings series. And the way language models work is which kind of rules are they're going to learn depends on the data itself. So if I train a language model on just the messages that I have sent, then it's going to speak in my way and learn the things that I know. But if we want the model to be able to recognize terms from 
different fields, so maybe geography, medicine, and so on, then we have to train it on very diverse set of sentences so that it learns the rules. And this is a typical data set that we train large language models on. And you can see here how it's composed. So it has archive, which is a lot of scientific publications. It has medical journals. Uh, it has a little bit of legal. It has a good chunk of all the text that can be found on the internet, books, code, etc. So it's quite diverse set of language. And this is where the model gets uh, its quote unquote knowledge from. So this is what goes into the model in order for the model to learn. And this is kind of how the models look like. So I on purpose chose a very fancy picture. The only thing I want you to get out of this slide is that these models are very complicated, very large, and by that they can figure out very complex rules. So this is an architecture very famous called uh, transformers. The thing on the left hand side um, is what we call an attention mechanism and it's basically a lot of mathematical operations stack on, stacked on top of each other. And the thing on the left hand side is just a tiny box of what you see on the right hand side. And there are 50 of them stacked together on top of each other. So here there are a lot of inner workings, a lot of mathematical moving parts that are trying to figure out the rules in natural language. And this model is very big, so it requires a lot of data, so it's a great fit for that. And if it's trained properly, it can lead to really strong machine learning or machine intelligence. But how do we train it? So we train it with the same task that I showed you before, kind of the prediction of the next word. So what we do in a very simple way is we go through one by one all the sentences that exist in the giant data set that we saw before. And for example, we have a sentence, I saw a cat, and then we take the previous prefix I saw A, and we ask the model to predict the next word. And then maybe the, the model makes a mistake and says a banana. And then the model corrects itself. It sees that the right word here is cat, so it decides to decrease the likelihood of predicting banana next time it sees this prefix, but to increase the probability of the word cat appearing. And by doing so over each sentence in the data set many, many times, eventually the model figure, figures out the rules behind language. And then it can generate sentences or continue generating sentences in a very plausible way that makes sense syntactically but also semantically. And one of the reasons why we have seen massive progress um, in the last few years and new models coming um, almost every month is because we have figured out the recipe that makes them really good. So it is essentially scale and scale of three different things. The first one is that the model needs to be very large, so a lot of parameters. The second one is that we need to train it on a lot of data. And the third one is that we have to train it for a long time, which requires a lot of compute power, essentially meaning that in order to train one large language model, we need um, a few million in order to, to be able to support this. Um, so this makes the models really, really big, and that's why you can't download ChatGPT locally and use it, but you interact with it through an API. Um, but the good news is that the large language models trained in such a way that have sort of general knowledge of language in various different areas are the basis for a lot of tasks that can be solved uh, when it comes to text. So for example, you can take a large language model and you can teach it to act as an assistant to be a little bit conversational and talk to you back and assist you with things like ChatGPT. Or if you wanna use it for a particular sector, let's say the legal sector, then you can train a large language model with general knowledge and we call it fine tune it, so kind of adapt it to legal language in order to understand further legal concepts. So if we take a large language model, we can basically adapt it and do a lot of useful things with it. And that brings me again to the opportunity of the public sector, because as we said, there is quite a lot of text here and a lot of, lot of opportunity, what we can do with this text. Um, and there are several talks about uh, possible applications of AI in the public sector afterwards, but just kind of to notch the idea, the way I see this is from two different directions. 
The first opportunity that I see is to make the government easier in the sense of how citizens see the government. So supporting citizens when interacting with the state. And this largely falls in the areas of guidance through different processes. For example, when I'm filling out my tax form or when I need to understand what are the rules to apply for a certain government support or a grant. Then it's a lot of navigation of regulations and simplifying that process. And the part that I see as the most relevant is increased transparency and increased accessibility. And this is something that the models are really good at, simplifying language and really adopting how they speak to you based on, on your knowledge and your perception of things. And the second approach of utilizing AI for text for the public sector is to make governance easier and basically supporting the public sector directly. Um, and this largely falls into speeding up processes and reducing bureaucracy and it basically means kind of outsourcing all the things that are very manual, very repetitive, very error prone to a machine such that everybody's happier and the people can focus on what really matters and the strategic aspects of their work. And of course, with every opportunity comes some risks uh, and that is going to be discussed afterwards as well. I personally don't fear that um, AI will replace humans or that robots will dominate. But one of the things that I wanted to point out is that most of the large language models that are currently trained and in use and that we try out ourselves are located in a very specific market, which is the US. So that means that every time we use it, we send the data there and they basically kind of have a monopoly of this super powerful technology and how it works. And by, by that fear, I actually want to point out a possibility, which is to strengthen the position of Switzerland. I think Switzerland is in a really unique spot, really nice spot, where it has access to high concentration of experts. Um, and this is because of the great schools and great universities that we have here that produce excellent talent. Also, a lot of the technical companies that are here. Switzerland is also an exporter of high-end knowledge work, so it really should think about how it can strengthen its position. So maybe something that we can all think about is creating a Swiss GPT. So if the state allows and creates a, a model, a generative model for understanding text here in Switzerland that is based locally and is able to give it to all its companies, all its organs, all its institutions, then the data is never sent to other countries. The position of Switzerland is very strong and everybody has access to very powerful technology that can really, really make a difference and is the future that is coming. And speaking about uh, really great things related to AI coming out of Switzerland uh, or AI first companies, I'm very proud to be part of an ETH spin-off uh, called Deep Judge. So all four founders of DeepJudge, we have a PhD in artificial intelligence from ETH Zurich. We all worked at Google for quite some time on semantic understanding of text. And we were in the lucky spots to be at the forefront of seeing this revolution of when it comes to AI understanding text. So we decided to take these breakthroughs and really bring it in a very uh, human-centric product uh, that is based on AI, where we don't aim to replace uh, legal professionals or humans in general, but rather to support them and to empower them. And what we have is basically a large language model that is meant to understand natural language and on top of that, legal concepts. The way we train our model is very similar to the recipe that you saw before. So in the first phase, we teach the model to have general knowledge and to understand natural language. Then in the second step, we teach the model to understand legal concepts, so maybe it now understands that poison pill means anti-takeover. So after step one and two, we have what we call a document understanding core, which means that any type of document that comes in, whether it's just with natural language, such as an email, or it's a contract or a ruling, the model forms an understanding of the content of the document. And then we deploy this document understanding core to customers, and we even further fine tune the core on the customer data. That means if there are some specific concepts that are used inside a company, maybe abbreviations 
or things like that, the model will pick them up as well. And since we saw before that a model kind of self-corrects itself by just looking at the, the sentences, there is never a need for humans to, to teach the model how to behave better. This is all done seamlessly to the customer. And the way it comes in the form of a product is basically a legal AI assistant that can really unlock the power of the collective knowledge inside a company or institution. So the first thing we do is we integrate with a database of documents, whether that's all the emails, contracts, invoices, et cetera. And we tell a company what is inside their vault of knowledge. So how many documents you have, how many contracts, what type of contracts, on which topics, and so on. But the main part of it all is being able to navigate and find the relevant document um, no matter what you're looking for. And this is something that really speeds up processes. For example, whenever we talk to law firms, they all say, oh, you know, we've done everything ourselves. We have probably done several cases on mergers of two pharma companies, but it's impossible to find it in the millions of documents that we have. Because basically right now, it's figuring out the rules, figuring out what kind of keywords to use in order to pull out the relevant document. Versus now, with semantic understanding of the content of documents, you can just describe the concept of what you're looking for, and you immediately get the relevant document, and you don't reinvent the wheel, you don't start from scratch, but you reuse the knowledge from everyone else around you. And this is a really, really massive game changer. And the three things that are really important to point out here is that our AI assistant or search engine is completely private. So because it's a model trained by us, we can deploy it on premise or on a secure cloud. So the data never touches servers in the US or open AI. Uh, it is very scalable. So we have figured out a way how to make it work on hundreds of millions of documents that you might have internally. Um, and it is semantic. So as I mentioned before, it works by understanding the content of documents and the questions you ask, and it finds you the best match based on meaning, not based on jumping on keywords individually. And law firms are one example of a use case of legal documents, but legal documents and documents in general are everywhere. Uh, so also there are a lot of documents that are open in the public sector, such as regulations, laws, proceedings, court rulings, and navigating through them is, is not always easy and finding the, the right one. So just to show you a use case of how such navigation capabilities can be used for the public sector, um, I have this example over here where I'm searching through the Swiss public rulings. And for example, I'm looking for an answer of, am I liable if there is a damage um, in case I'm performing a favor to someone? Um, and I just write it with my natural words as it comes um, intuitively to me. I don't worry about hitting certain keywords. And then the model understands the concepts behind liability, doing favor, and all of that, and pulls out relevant documents, and even jumps on the relevant paragraph immediately. So the first one talks about um, a problem occurring when someone is babysitting a neighbor's child as a favor. The second one, someone helping carry uh, something else with someone as a favor, then the other person gets hurt. So it really tells you what the liability here is in various different scenarios. And I see the benefits here, again, tying to the previous uh, thing we mentioned of both sides. This is easier for me as an ordinary citizen that don't understand legalese. If I just type it out and I don't know what are the relevant law articles, I can immediately find the relevant rulings but also for professionals themselves not to worry about crafting different queries and worrying whether they have missed one and by doing so missed a super highly relevant result. And at the end, I just wanna highlight one more thing that I find to be really important and it should be talked about. So there are some problems with generative large language models. And generative language models are models that generate text back at you, like ChatGPT, for example. The problems are that first they hallucinate. So if I ask the same question, am I liable during a favor, then there might be an answer. It might be true, it might not be true. It might even invent something like this person said this and this and this or this happened. And this kind of connects to the second point, which is intransparency or fact checking. Even if it is true what it's saying, you can't really understand why it says that. You can't ask it, but why did you say this? How did you come up with this answer? 
It's also inconsistent in the way it responds back to you. It's not really in the style of, let's say, the public sector or a law firm or a company. But the most important point of it all is that every time you're using ChatGPT, you're sending your data to OpenAI. And this is a big privacy concern for a lot of different companies. And this brings me to the point that search engine is the only thing that generative models can rely on in order to overcome these challenges. So the way that combination would work as we envision it is that first you apply your search engine to find the relevant documents in your own collection to a particular question or answer. And then the generative model generates back the answer, maybe summarizing that or making a conclusion out of that. And with this, you tackle all of these challenges. So you immediately get a reference document that supports the answer. It tells you, oh, I looked at these rulings when I figured this out. It's very transparent. It speaks in the way you speak because it's relying on your documents. And it's entirely private because it's working inside your company and the data never touches the servers of OpenAI. And finally, I want to highlight another project that partially comes out, out of Switzerland. Uh, so it's the Open Assistant, and this was led by my co-founder and our CTO, Yannick Kilcher. So this is a completely volunteer project where they created the best performing alternative of ChatGPT that is entirely open sourced. And what they did is they had a massive crowd collect data set, teach the machine, train these models, and now we have this model that is really an open source alternative, which means that companies can use it, um, universities can use it locally, and it performs in the style of ChatGPT. So with that, I would like to thank you, and I'm looking forward to the upcoming talks of how we can all benefit from the latest breakthroughs of AI and text. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.